I'm going to send you my website. Um, Perfect. Yeah, if you can, just send it to me and I'll add it to the link. And then I have right. another another one, the Time Travel Education Center. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, thank you. I got it. We are live. My name is Dr. Charnel Wolverton Sihan. I'm super excited to be with you guys today. And also a new guest, Peter Moon. He's an author and conference speaker and kind of been around the block for a little bit. Um, I found out with him just because of my own journey of figuring out and remembering things. And someone actually pointed out uh, one of your books from a long time ago. And as a matter of fact, it just had its silver anniversary um, regarding the Montauk project. But to get started here, uh, first I want to remind everybody, please go to swiftfire.org swiftfire.org and grab the newsletter just so with anything censorship then we're always like connected and you know what's going on but i would love for you peter just to share a little bit about your background and where you are and how you got here just a little bit so people can get to know you a little bit okay oh uh, you said you're a doctor are you a, a practitioner of, of uh health naturopathic health yes Oh, great. Wonderful. It's just nice to get that orientation. Um, my history is kind of long and complex. And it, uh, but when I first came to notoriety was in 1992, when I uh, published the Montauk Project Experiments in Time by Preston Nichols. And of course, I was very much in the background. Nobody really knew who I was. Nobody really wanted to know who I was. And uh, I was very comfortable with that because uh, I had a background. Preston Nichols was somebody who had suffered mind control in the tradition. Well, sort of in the tradition of the typical MK Ultra mind control, but it was much more than that. The thing that was unique about Preston Nichols is that he was also a genius when it came to the subject of electromagnetics and human psychology as well. And he uh, was also an expert in studying the phenomena of time. Now, my background that made me suitable towards working with him was that I had, at that point, it, I met him in the end of 1990, and I had been um, out of the Church of Scientology for seven years. I had left the Church of Scientology seven years. I had worked at the highest levels in that church. I was a... Um, in the secretarial pool for L. Ron Hubbard. I had a great insight into him and who he was. He was an expert in mind control. Um, I understood it, had worked with it in the Navy and in his early years in Washington, DC. So that was my background. And I had a very peculiar, as history goes, it's, it's sort of a peculiar uh, understanding and relationship with him as opposed to the rank and file who were involved in that organization. And now you have many horror stories that you hear uh, in that organ. So that was my background. And after being out of that, I had studied the occult when I understood Hubbard's fascination with it. And this led me to Preston Nichols and the experiments in time, which took place at Montauk, New York, at the Eastern end of Long Island. And you had mentioned the silver anniversary edition of the Montauk Project Experiments in Time. Uh, that was released a couple of years ago in celebration of the 25th anniversary of the publication of the original book. This book is uh, much thicker because it not only adds anecdotes about Preston Nichols, who's passed away, I could not tell at the time. It also goes into the subsequent investigation, which led to the actual current day actuality of time travel. Uh, a, a friend of mine who became a friend of mine after reading this book has an actual uh, institute dedicated to traveling in time. Uh, he's very mysterious. Da Dr. David Anderson. His website is andersoninstitute.com. I have simplified the most basic tenets that demonstrate that the math and physics, demonstrating that time travel is within the bounds of math and physics, simple math and physics, not anything complicated. Um, 
And that's demonstrated with seven free videos at that website, timetraveleducationcenter.com. So that's a bit of a background of who I am. Uh, we do have some some squeaking in the background. I don't know what that is. Um, but um, in any case, I, if, if you where would you like me to begin? That's my background. Well, and I'm just going to jump in before um, you talk about your new book and your new project that just got released. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, being in the Scientology world and getting to know um, everyone involved with that. And to be honest, I, you know, I've got several of his books and you talked about um, the mind control situation. When he started that, it wasn't for the purpose to be used for the dark side or to harm or or hurt anybody. It was actually to help people, to free people, but it just kind of got twisted and changed around. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yes, totally. Uh, yes. And, and it became uh, an abortion in the truest sense of the word. Uh, yes, it's uh, But he would have been the first to have told you that uh, anything in that he studied was a double-edged sword. It could mm -hmm. be used negatively or positively. And, and that, I mean, that's just like uh, martial arts can be used negatively or positively. They can be used Everything. for healing. Yeah. A anything, a knife, a knife computers. can be used. Positively. Yeah, computers, cell phones, cars. We can do that all day. You know, it's about exactly. intent, right? Exactly. And, exactly. and unfortunately, I think um, things got into the wrong ha hands. You know, he's a genius. And he had skills to put things together, and it just got completely, basically um, stolen, and then repackaged in this other way for harm, which is really sad. But well, well I can tell you, uh, the the whole modus operandi switched from actually helping people uh, on a consistent basis, um, or that was at least the attempted goal. Uh, not not everybody got all the help they wanted or needed, but um, it it became a siphoning of the rich mm -hmm. uh, to go and uh, get money from very rich people, and this is how it sustains itself. They refer to them as whales because they're huge in terms of their ability to donate, and that's what keeps the actual uh, church alive, and they've accumulated. <clears throat> what's been said to be billions of dollars uh, by um, extracting, if not extorting, uh, yep. money from their and, flock. And then using celebrities and what have you um, to to be their minions to, you know, basically bring pe more people in and then they get that information and it just is this continuum, which is, yeah, not, not the yeah, topic. What, what, what I would say about this, what made this subject uh, so relevant uh, to my work was that when I met, see, one of the things that Hubbard talked about, that this never gets much attention by uh, Scientologists, by ex-Scientologists, by people who are criticizing the movement or even advocating him or his techniques. It, um, in the early 50s, he wrote books, very early 50s, he wrote some books, one of which was called Scientology 880. Mm -hmm. uh, there were others, 8808, Scientology 8808. And he talked about using electronics to manipulate uh, spiritual beings. He said that electricity, electronics were used by people who were in bodies, incarnated in meat bodies is what he referred to them human human or humanoid bodies. And their whole game was to use electronics to uh, approximate the frequency of spiritual beings who would operate on an electronic frequency, snare them and implant them. Now, mm -hmm. this was, you know, kind of really off the wall for 1950s, uh, but his congregation basically believed it. And these he had techniques used to address these visual images of people mm -hmm. having experienced this. Now, when I came along in 1971, which was a boom year for Scientology, particularly at, at the location where I had gotten involved in Davis, California, uh, about an hour in 
15 minutes outside of San Francisco. It, it was, um, you know, I, I experimented with these techniques. I learned these techniques uh, both to and fro of uh, addressing mental images of being electronically zapped, for lack of a better expression. And so this, but this was like early on. And it, of course, it was always a part of what could come up in one's Scientology or counseling and whatnot. But when I met Preston Nichols, he was a crystal clear example of somebody who not only had suffered trauma through electronics, he was also a somebody who was involved in manipulating people with electronics. Mm -hmm. And so what L. Ron Hubbard had said almost offhandedly and wrote about almost offhandedly in the 1950s, Preston Nichols had been involved in a super uh, expository example of this type of uh, behavior and uh, m manipulations. So I said, wow, if, if and, and the stuff that I, I did in those days was never anything that was taken uh, you know, into 3D reality. It right. was just done in a personal counseling session to alleviate uh, mental or emotional trauma uh, that could be stirred up. Mm -hmm. Restimulated was the word they used. And then you would uh, free yourself of it and all of the quote unquote karmic bonds to that. So I right. had had a lot, any lot of, go ahead. Any attachments to that? Because there is like a clearing that's involved. So we don't get right. trapped in a signature code loop, a trauma loop. Right. And, and, and the testament that that was of benefit to me uh, was that I was able to deal in this weird world of Preston Nichols um, and all of the training I had received there enabled me to deal in the weird world of Preston Nichols and not be sucked in by it. And also to exposit his story, something that other people were not able to do. Um, there was one guy working on it or wanted to work on it uh, before I did. And, and he had dibs on it and he got so scared. He says, no, you wow. do it. I, I don't want anything to do with this. Uh, there was also a writer for the New York Times, a science writer who was involved. Uh, he got scared too. He said, this is too real. And wow. he backed, he backed away. So um, that, that, that background really helped. And of course, Preston Nichols was um, involved in experiments where they would use radar mm -hmm. and they would use uh, it to emulate uh, the mind of man to read, to read the emotions, uh, the frequencies that were emanating off of the, the human. And then also, to take the emanations emanating out of the human, change yeah. them, modify them with radar, and then also amplify them and broadcast them out a huge transmitter that yeah. was located at the end of Montauk, New York, and would affect animal behavior. It would affect yeah. human behavior. I was uh, just about to go there. Yeah, so okay. my dad worked on those radars. Um, not only there in Montauk, we were there 73 to 76 but on other ones in Japan and North Dakota and Iceland and other places that they had that. So I was just going to bring up the whole them using it even on the barracks. They used it on the animals and all of a sudden the animals showed up or the climate would change or hundreds of teenagers would show up as you, you know, as you well, wrote. Yes, yes, yes. But you actually saw some of this when you were I was, there? I was actually a part of the MyLab problem project that was down there, which we could talk about in another story. So I'm, I'm just for that, those. That, that I find quite interesting uh, that you are an actual eyewitness to some of this stuff, because those people are few and far between that, that have actually witnessed this stuff. Uh, and, they, and not a lot of women, that most of them are boys. Yeah, there, there, there have been some women. Uh, they've actually come forth more than the boys. And some of the boys that come forth are so discombobulated and or uh, non-cohesive in what they have to say that they don't make good uh, interviews. Well, or, it's, it's or, a or lot stuff. for the brain. And what I have found is um, my time clock is completely broke. Like I, 
there's a lot of side effects to all this stuff that happened and but there's good and everything and i just you know um try to use everything for the good i could get stuck in victim mode forever and also there's things that i can do and that i know um and that i'm using for my mission from here on um to to bring light to the things and also to help other people with with what i'm able to do and know um when they did scalar waves on me it showed that somehow i could change the weather and or people's biofields and i mean like i said that's a long story and how i have this all this information is like it's always been in there but they they slate you so you don't remember and i had been having memories for years of just these things that would pop up that literally did not make sense and i could not put anything together until someone who was there actually was at the same place i was in real life and said oh my god and remembered me and said you're remembering the chair aren't you and i was just like wow and um and i had already written a book called the science of miracles that talked a lot about this manipulation of energy for the positive and knew all of that like because it was in there somewhere but i just didn't understand how i knew because i don't know if that makes any sense but um yeah i don't have all of my memory i'm going to cry but i don't have every memory and it might be better that i don't and also yeah I, I you know i haven't even finished your entire book because i just recently got it and i'm like diving all in i'm just so fascinated by you and hubbard and all of this so you know people not only know about it and know about you and your new books and your tons of other books i mean you have so many facets um but also still actually just trying to reverse engineer what i went through and also remember and what that means for me now if that makes sense well it, it makes sense you've awfully been through an awful lot and um that's that's tough i hope i hope the stuff i've done can bring you some closure on some it, of this stuff it's brought like so much and then my dad too you know working on the radars that's the thing they don't know, they didn't know what they were working on. My dad, like I can detect BS and either he's the best liar ever, but, or, you know, but it, everything was so segre, you know, segregated. And, you know, I don't think a lot of people even knew what they were working on. You know, I don't know what you You're know. You're probably about. right because it, that's compartmentalization. Um, and, and this is what's, uh, what happens when it comes to very obscure um, projects. So this is par for the course. It would stand to reason that, uh, that, you, that it was compartmentalized and these people didn't know. Although I've also heard that people who worked with radar uh, in the military or whatnot are very offhand about the fact that they would notice how it would change the moods of people. They, they would see the whole uh, area they were around change in moods when different radar frequencies were were changed. And and my hypothesis, call me crazy, is that they're still using this. And that would be a great explanation why maybe there's a sudden uh, riot somewhere and everyone's gone you know, cuckoo and they don't know why or whatever, because when they did these animals and teenagers and barracks and all these experiments way, way, way back, you know, once that shift happened in frequency or it was turned off, they were kind of like, how did I get here? And kind of came back to themselves versus, you know, so maybe that is an explanation. Uh, you know, I, of course they're well, doing well, it on television yeah. and radio and everything else, but I think on a, you know, weather, Weather is a big thing, um, but I think on a mind control, they're still doing this. Well, yes, and weather is very, uh, um, very related to mood. Like if it's a nice, bright, happy day, everybody's bright and happy. If it's a somber day, wow, uh, rainy day, so yeah, I mean that's that's right there. So you see an immediate relationship between the human and the animal world and the weather. And so how far is that from, you know, uh, 
So Control. using the weather to cause fear, like constant tornadoes or constant fires or, you know, that could just keep people in the state of chaos of what could happen well, next. Yes. And it was it was Joseph Stalin and who very much you uh, understood the psychology of psychopolitics, which was to create terror and use terror as a way to control the population. You see this today with the media creating terror around the virus, uh, around vaccinations. Uh, and, and you see a, a good percentage, if not a great percent of the, the population is absolutely terrified of this uh, virus. Um, and it's a great mystery, uh, you know, well, let me. Yeah. I found, someone sent me this yesterday. It says in the 60s, the KGB did some fascinating psychological, psych, psychological experiments. They learned if you bombard human subjects with fear nonstop for two months or less, most of the subjects are completely brainwashed to believe any false message. The point is that no amount, wait, to the point that no amount of clear information that was given to them could change their mind. Well, this, 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 yes. And this also applies in the quote unquote natural order of things. Uh, when you tell a person uh, what will fix them or heal their condition, uh, and this is not, has nothing to do with being bombarded intensely with fear. They, they, they have been, they're in a habitual situation where they're not going to listen because they're attached emotionally and mentally to their disease or disability or, or painful condition. And so when you offer them, whether it be a something in the guise of a nutritional supplement or the like, possibly a medication, possibly uh, an exercise, mm -hmm. they will discard you. They will yep. discard what you say because they want to uh, subconsciously or otherwise uh, proliferate their state of misery. So, yeah, per by per to participate and or they're so uh, connected to the person who gave them the information, whether it's a quote doctor who has authority because they have a white coat or the government because people are like, well, of course the government would protect me, you know, and it's like, I say question everything and everyone and have the courage to to ask why you believe what you believe and go outside of those boxes. Yes, of course, uh, as you continue to read in that book, you will see that I've taken this subject. Now, this is this subject, as they say, is a double edged sword, just like Scientology, because most people will take it up to the level of we're controlled and they will sit there at that level and keep perpetrating the control. So the actual sharing of the information can act as a perpetuation of the information because the person and the audience tends to snag onto it mm -hmm. and it's convinced that mind control is real. So he wants to convince other people that it's real. And, you know, he's in effect being mind controlled or, or emanating that frequency. I've taken this, subject to a whole nother level. And, but then again, it was with the study of other dangerous elements, uh, which had to do with the occult, because when I went to investigate Preston Nichols story, um, I began to have experiences with synchronicity or coincidence. And this actually was not any different than um, Morris K. Jessup. He was the one who first broke the story on the Philadelphia experiment. And mm -hmm. he began to have strange coincidences because he began to interact with the people or phenomena that was involved in the Philadelphia experiment. And he ended up dead um, with a carbon monoxide poisoning in a car. It, it was always thought to be uh, Mysterious. a suicide, a suicide that was made, that wasn't a, a homicide that was made to look like a suicide. Mm -hmm. So uh, the difference here was I was not vulnerable to the same things Morris Jessup was. Uh, he wrote a book called The Case a Case for the UFO or The mm -hmm. Case for the UFO. 
Um, but the, the thing is, is that when I began to experience synchronicity, I began to not only correlate it with uh, um, so much of what uh, the energy of Montauk, which was involved with the energy of Aleister Crowley, uh, who identified himself as the B666 and was uh, uh, Hubbard, somebody that Hubbard uh, studied and emulated uh, to a certain degree. Now, but then I found all these synchronicities with the dark 666 led to the revelation that there was once ancient pyramids on the land where the, the time travel experiments took place at Montauk. And I wrote a book called The Pyramids of Montauk to explain and that the people who were the guardians or custodians of these pyramids were the pharaohs of Montauk. They were known as the pharaoh family or the they were the royal tribe of Long Island. And of course they were declared extinct in 19, 1909 uh, because they wanted the land. So they, the, the, the tribe had been displaced. I would eventually meet the medicine man of the Montauk tribe wow. and the shaman, via the shaman. It took me, you know, I met her a year in. It took me 14 years to meet him. And wow. he completely changed my life by introducing me not only to Qigong, uh, but to a very uh, rarefied branch of Qigong. Uh, and he introduced me to his teacher, uh, Grandmaster Roosevelt Ganey of Brooklyn, New York, who I studied with for 10 years, uh, his last 10 years. And so um, that was a great positive uh, experience because it gave me a, a much younger ability to be much younger than my years. So um, I, I have done very well with that regard. That was a great positive. But I also found, because um, I used to have monthly meetings at my house on Montauk to give and exchange information uh, about the Montauk project. And it was like a public service and it was also a duty. It was also my job. But the meetings had uh, kind of, they came, I put them to a stop when I got involved with the Qigong, and of course, I had the medicine man come and talk. But when I first gave my first lecture about Qigong uh, and how I got into it, uh, several people came up to me afterwards. They said, that's the best talk you've ever given. And, but you know, not one person was interested in learning it or doing it, except mm -hmm. for one. Except for one. I didn't recognize him, but he was my nutritionist from years ago and uh we became friends and uh but he had a problem is that he had a lot of experience with breath and yoga so he appreciated what i was saying uh he wanted to study under me and i said you're going to come to class and the problem with him is he wouldn't do the exercises at home he would only do them in class so he didn't do the work but mm -hmm. it's like so i realized that these people just wanted to talk about conspiracy and stay at that level. I could see it. I said, I can't do these meetings anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, it, I, I tried to reinvent the meeting. I had it at somebody else's house, but there it was just as bad, if not worse, because people came and they wanted to eat and gab about this conspiracy or this situation and just socialize. And one of my friends who was a shaman, she looked at me and she says, this is, we can't do this. So we had to meet separately once a month in back of the group because we didn't want them involved. And then I just, you know, said the hell with this group because it's not, uh, the people were not up to healing anybody, let alone themselves. This is a big problem because people are so egocentric. They figured out the whole world. They figured out that we need vaccinations. They figured out that, you know, the government knows what it's doing right. They figured out Biden is better than Trump. They figured out Trump is better than Biden. And all of this stuff is a distraction from your own personal self-development, which usually comes in last place uh, for people. In fact, I, I once uh, had dinner with a friend of the family and uh, the... I mean, I knew this woman for a long time and, and her, 
I was meeting her boyfriend. And her daughter didn't like the boyfriend at all. And, you know, so I kind of had a bad opinion of the boyfriend going in. And we got along great because he was an acupuncturist. And it, it wasn't that he was an acupuncturist that I got on great. He told me of all the clients he had, nobody would listen to his advice to get better. They just bitch about their condition. He'd say, well, you have this, this, and this. You have to take this, this, and this. And they would inevitably never do it. I mean, you can't change that. They want him to fix them, you know, stick yeah. some needles and fix me. And you have to take personal responsibility for your own condition. So I, I could understand him very well um, trying to, uh, you know, people doing things 180 degrees in the wrong direction in order to help themselves. Common problem. Uh, this was a common problem investigating Montauk because uh, I didn't get help. I got the reverse of help. Mm -hmm. Another bright aspect of all of this was a man had read this book and he felt that it woke him up spiritually. And accordingly, he looked into what I was doing. He signed up for my newsletter and he had a time. I do have a newsletter, by the way, a quarterly newsletter, uh, the Montauk Pulse, which has been in pub, uh, published since 1993. And he, uh, he showed up at one of our meetings a year after subscribing, he is stationary at the Time Travel Research Center. And when I met him, I didn't realize he was a real, a real character with a real Time Travel Research Center. On Long Island, it was at that time. And he befriended me, Dr. David Anderson, in 1999 is when I met him. And right after, he says, I want to take you out to lunch. I want to get to know you. I'd like to work with you. So he said, after he took me to lunch, he says, I want to bring you to Romania. He says, I have a, a research center there because they have the best mathematicians in the world. I have another one in New Mexico. And so we began uh, an association uh, that was very flighty because he'd come and go. He, he'd say, you know, I'm not always going to be available. He's very mysterious. He's still in my life to this day, although very peripherally. And he eventually did bring me to, to Romania. And then I got involved with a whole publication of books called the Transylvania series. Mm -hmm. uh, Transylvania Sunrise is the first book in the series where they discovered a holographic chamber. Well, it was a chamber that had holographic technology beneath the Romanian Sphinx. So David actually paid for my first trip to Romania. Uh, he wanted to get me there. And then the second year I went back, he lectured extensively on time travel. Um, the third year, he didn't come. His communication was cut off with Romania, um, mm -hmm. which is a whole other story, which I'm only beginning to realize how I can repair that possibly. And he uh, announced on the radio that he could now effectuate time travel for human beings. When I first met him, it was only the size of a soccer ball. He could slow down or speed up time. And his operation was heavily invested in by the medical field because they could preserve organs by slowing time down. So the organ, whether it be a heart, a liver, or a spleen, they, they decay. Putting them in an ice box doesn't quite work. So right. he, uh, this technology, but he had evolved to 2010 to the point where he could do human beings. And he then, I saw the last time I saw him physically was in 2010, 11 years ago at Montauk. He had come out to Montauk to join myself and the medicine man and lecture uh, on time travel. He showed a video to about 20 of us that showed an early uh, prototype of his time reactor, which he calls it, which showed up amaryllis plant grow in three minutes, which would normally take four days. So uh, that's the closest I've seen to his operation. He has said that he would uh, at some stage be able to see his facility at some point. Uh, the and last when time. Was this? What? And when was this? What year? Well, 
I saw the, the video in 2010. He, that was an early video. He, he said a few years ago, I asked him in, in a public venue, which was done via Skype. I said, you know, you've said that I'd be able to see the lab someday. I said, how, how you know, any news on that? He says, well, I think that day's coming very close. Of course, that was, you know, two or three years ago. So um, he has, I've spoken to him very sporadically. And um, he remains under a cloak of uh, low profile, mm -hmm. uh, generally for reasons that uh, people can get compromised. And mm -hmm. people in his life have been compromised. Uh, so it, it could be a, a form of protection. And um, it's very interesting, but this is actual science and technology. And it's certainly nothing uh, you're going to hear about by the physicists who get on TV and pontificate. Mm -hmm. We even had an instance of, uh, I was involved in a documentary in um, 2000. Uh, 19, and they got my permission to use the book, the material. They even interviewed me, but they cut every mention of Dr. David Anderson. They showed the patent that I gave them, and then they had Michio Kaku get up and say, uh, oh, this looks like the scrawlings of a child. There is no power source. You have to have tremendous power. And the the patent, which is Dr. David Anderson's, it does have a power source. He lied. It, it uh, I could give a whole, I can't do it right now, but a whole dissertation on how power is generated through time reaction. Uh, he discovered this. He was getting more power. So this would solve the world's energy problems. So, you know, you have the media that is predisposed to lie and get things wrong. Uh, because people are so dedicated to being wrong, mm -hmm. being, and, and sometimes they're aggressively wrong. Uh, it's, you know, how wrong can you be? Um, and so people listen to, you talk about fear or, or being bombarded with fear. The media is a different type of bombardment. It's a subtle, slow fear. It's a subtle propaganda mechanism. Well, and, and it goes through on beta waves, which is another topic, but that's where they can really hook you in to the fear and then the cortisol and the belief systems and the brainwashing and well, and this, there's this, a science. Yeah, exactly. And this brings us to one of the greatest mind control propaganda of all time. And this is the new book that I, I published and wrote with Douglas Dietrich, a former documents destruction expert for the Department of Defense at the Presidio military base, known as the Pentagon of the West Coast, uh, before it was uh, taken out of commission uh, due to his efforts to expose the sexual child abuse that was taking place at the Presidio, which the uh, main alleged perpetrator, Gary Hambright, was, was the one who was fingered, and it was his trial that brought down or arraignment that brought down the Presidio. But the main uh, person who was alleged was Dr. Michael Aquino, yeah. a devout Satanist, a, a founder of the Temple of Set, who yeah. the army would not investigate him in relation to this, even though they found all sorts of evidence at his home in San Francisco, a nearby home in San Francisco. And they didn't pursue him on ground uh, be, for reasons of national security. Uh, but they did take the base down. They sold it to George Lucas, who destroyed any remnants of evidence uh, by raising all the, all the area where the child abuse took place. And uh, then he eventually sold it to Disney when he sold his Star Wars franchise to Disney. So, and Disney has now a, a Walt Disney Museum on the grounds, um, amongst other things. But um, so, the, the, this, But what this book, The Roswell Deception and the Demystification of World War II, what it does is it shows how the entirety of what we've been told about World War II is an utter and complete lie. And 
one of which is that the Office of War Information, which was formed by FDR after Pearl Harbor, was dedicated to censoring all information in and out of the United States with regard to the war and completely controlling the public's view. And one of the, the first actions of war after in the, in the Pacific theater after um, Pearl Harbor was the Japanese sent huge dirigibles uh, up the Kuroshio current, up the coast of Japan, across the Pacific North. And this is the Kuroshio current. Uh, Emperor Hirohito was the one who was the most involved in uh, prosecuting the war. The Americans never tell you this. They said, oh, he was just a, a good old boy who wasn't involved with all this stuff. Um, they wanted to get him. They wanted to destroy him and his empire. They never did. And uh, he prosecuted the war uh, because he was a doctor of marine biology, a PhD, and he had read a, a story by Jack London uh, called The Unparalleled Invasion, which was to exterminate the yellow race. And he said, as a young boy, he says, we're going to have to protect ourselves. So he studied marine biology. He studied, uh, he was, they had a spy in Japan that got a yellow fever virus. And they, he ratcheted up way up and then had to ratchet it back down. It could kill the entire population of the United States. And he uh, was able to use these in porcelain bombs and put them in dirigibles. And he copied and improved the dirigible technology of both Germany and the United States. And he would test these and use them over China in the hilly ravines of China where people didn't leave. So it was very isolated and they were at war with China. So they were extensively tested. Now, the America knew he was doing this stuff. They knew he was uh, using these weapons in China and they were very afraid of him. And so after Pearl Harbor, he sent these huge dirigibles over Los Angeles, which became known as the Battle of Los Angeles. And, the uh, and they were afraid that he had the yellow fever vaccine and were gonna use it against him because they just sit there and hovered. Mm -hmm. They weren't, uh, the Americans were trying to shoot down the airplanes that were attached to these dirigibles because they could attach several airplanes to them, small airplanes, wow. mini tanks. And the, the Japanese were not there to kill the Americans. They were there to scare them and subdue them because the Americans had been waging war on the Japanese empire. It's antecedent going way back to Commodore Perry in 1852 or 1853, when he invaded Japan at gunpoint and made them participate in the world economy in an effort to subjugate them eventually to the United States, which is, was the whole goal, uh, was to first subjugate them and then utterly destroy every last Japanese on earth. Um, well, and the, let me stop you here real quick because Tompkins uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with William Tompkins. He was at that battle. I mean, he saw it. He was an eyewitness. Now, he thought they were UFOs, right? And I think a lot I of don't people... Know William Tompkins. I don't know that name. Uh, can you explain who he is? Uh, he used to work for um, all the different submarine places. He was a kid at the time, but he grew up later. Um, you know, he, he witnessed this. And to his recollection and or understanding was that these had to be UFOs because they were just strange objects. You know, I mean, by definition, I guess they were unidentified um, in some ways, but- They knew um, damn well what they were. They knew damn well what they were. The military did. Not yeah. necessarily the, the man in the street. Uh, right, there was the civilians actual, didn't. Right, right. But you're saying an, the military did. There was an actual eyewitness who saw these things. I mean, they're in the newspapers. You know, they yeah. have debris falling and some kid went up, uh, saw an army guy, and the army guy says, they're aliens. You know, yeah. the army was told to tell people they were aliens. Uh, and this story, okay. this story was used from day one. They are, uh, they were super dirigibles as long as 300 meters, and they were huge. And mm -hmm. the, the uh, soldiers were so, uh, or the army was so afraid that they created a yellow fever vaccine that was untested, unapproved. They used it on their own men. They killed 50,000 of their own men. Oh. They disabled hundreds of thousands more. And this became a great secret. 
that the army has been trying to hide and cover up ever since. How do we know this? Because Douglas Dietrich was assigned to burn these documents wow. at the Presidio, which is a whole other story in itself. However, pardon me? And this is in your book? Oh yeah, yeah. All this stuff is in my book in much more detail. Now, what happens is these dirigibles are so, uh, they're, they're great weapons of war. Now, they had, they had uh, killed 50,000 uh, of, of the enemy without even lifting a finger other than flying these dirigibles over on the air current. It takes them a short time, a few days to get over to America, down the California coast, and then they take another current back uh, that led back into Japanese territory and they come home. They were only there to send a message. Now, uh, so many things about World War II have been told, like uh, after the Pearl Harbor defeat, there was the Battle of Midway and Emperor Hirohito deliberately uh, allowed his aircraft carriers to be sacrificed because aircraft carriers are of no uh, real value because you have all your aircraft. What they wanted is they, they distracted the Americans to Midway uh, he also uh, defeat, uh, killed his uh, admiral Yamamoto, who was a he considered who was a traitor to him. So the emperor was doing that. But meanwhile, while the Battle of Midway was going on, the Japanese were invading the Aleutian Islands because the Aleutian oh. Islands were something that the Americans could attack Japan from, and so they they took over the Aleutian Islands, and that and they so America had the Office of War Information and assigned people to rewrite the history and lie about it and wow. to make it seem much better. Now, where this becomes, and we have just enough time to uh, get to, to some of the climax of where this goes, is that when the atom bombs, well, first off, the Americans got their atom bomb from Germany. Germany had, a, had, a, had, a, had an atom bomb, what they called Little Boy. And Charles Lindbergh, who was very pro-German, they used Charles Lindbergh to go get it, Harry Truman did. Roosevelt couldn't stand him. And he, he was able to get, uh, and this was after the Germans had been defeated. Uh, and he got the, the, the uh, atom bomb, brought it back to New Mexico. And that was the, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Hiroshima. The, drum, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was actually uh, created by the Americans. Uh, the Japanese already had atomic warfare, uh, as did the Germans. The Germans had dropped a bomb in 1939, or 1939, I, I don't, I it was in, I think, Lithuania. But this is all historical. And Hitler didn't want to use uh, atomic bombs because it would compromise the genetics of the Aryan race. Yeah. And, it, it, and so, he, and so he, he didn't, it was too inhumane for him uh, in, in that respect. That's a lot. <laughs> Scary. Well, well, yes, yes, but not to the Americans. Uh, and they named the spot where they did the, the, the bomb, Trinity. And this was to desecrate the Holy Trinity. Uh, mm. there, there was a, a big satanic impulse within the United States Army uh, to do this bomb. Now, when the bomb, the first bomb was delivered to, to Hiroshima, um, Emperor Hirohito's response was to send three dirigibles to America with weapons of mass destruction, meaning the yellow fever vaccine. He did not, he was not intending to release them. He wanted to show them what they could do. One crashed in New Mexico at, um, and in San Antonio, I believe it was. The other one, the other two landed in, in Tanapa Army Airfield, which is now Area 51. Wow. And, 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 and then what, what he, now none of the Japanese forces were in Japan. They were all in mainland China. Japan had taken over mainland China, the populated area of it. So it didn't do any damage to the uh, the Japanese. The Americans were not capable of prosecuting the war in the in the um, Pacific theater. They were very at a low ebb in that regard. And anyway, and all the specifics of this are, are outlined in the book. But the um, atomic. Uh, or, or the, the the dirigibles that landed in uh, at Tanapa were they showed they had these these weapons that would just could kill the whole world, let alone America. 
In the meantime, Hirohito had all mapped out the air, co air currents of the United States by sending over these Fugo balloon bombs that were setting uh, massive fires in the, in the Northwest. And so he knew the air currents. He could have destroyed the United States. He wanted them to know that he could destroy the United States. And at that point, they capitulated to his demand. He'd been asking for peace since January. But they said, no, no. They wanted to do the atom bomb and they didn't want him as emperor. Now they acceded to his demand to remain as emperor. So the this battleship Missouri ceremony was not a real ceremony. It wow. was not, it was just to appease the public. In actual fact, you can find the Treaty of San Francisco was signed on September 8th, 1951, which was the actual treaty of peace between Japan and the United States and the allies. Wow. And it also went into effect on the emperor's birthday on 28 April, 1952. And the emperor insisted that we have Japanese, that the Japanese be able to participate in the commerce, international commerce, because the Americans had been cutting them off. That was another motivation for World War II. They were cutting them off from the international commerce. So everything that we saw as kids, when I was a kid, was made in Japan, made in Japan, made in Japan. And the story goes back to, well, we were building up their country because we're so good hearted. In actual fact, the Americans had to clean up all the atomic rubble. It killed many of the soldiers or uh, dis, uh, disabled them from, it wasn't the Japanese who cleaned up the radiation. The Japanese paid no war, war reparations to the United States whatsoever to wow. this day. None. And so you see, you have this spin. Now, where these dirigibles become very interesting is because the dirigibles were in the hands of the Americans. They kept the, the tiny Japanese as prisoners. They were from the Yakuza clan and they cut off a pinky finger as atonement. It was a, it was a, a very, what you call a brutal uh, cult they were, but they were loyal to the emperor. So they had these tiny Yakuza's about four feet who operated the dirigibles for small size. The Americans could not operate the dirigibles. They forced the tiny Yakuza to operate them. And some of them escaped in some of the flying craft that they had, which were called Voigt 173s that had been modified to the Japanese. They were superior aircraft to what the Americans had. They were also known as the Zimmer Skimmer. They looked like pancakes. Mm -hmm. And these were the, the, the actual escaping Japanese uh, who escaped America on these. They were test flying them for the Americans, but they escaped over Mount Rainier. And mm -hmm. Kenneth Arnold saw them. And that is what gave the world the term flying saucer. Mm -hmm. uh, in night, this is about six weeks or a few weeks, maybe I think it was two weeks before Roswell. And then uh, wow. they were, oh, and then these, the big dirigible was uh, flying uh, over the four corners and then the wind caught it. And the, the tiny Yakuza were being tortured by the Americans. They said, it's better to kill ourselves than to uh, pander to these Americans. And they, they these, these air balloons were, were had uh, hydrogen, not helium. They could blow up very quick if you knew how to do it. And this crash was what became the Roswell crash. The tiny little bodies were Asian bodies. Uh, they had no hair because they shaved off all their hair so that they wouldn't fire up. And uh, this is, in the whole Roswell story, they, they said flying saucer, flying saucer. And they put out this story and then withdrew it to make everybody think they were hiding stuff about aliens. And they perpetrated this fiction of aliens. The whole Roswell Museum is a bunch of uh, bunk and it's all gone into in the book. Uh, and so meanwhile, everybody thinks we've been invaded by aliens when it, the United States has just lied so much about the losses they've taken and how superior Japan actually is technologically. This is a big hidden thing. And they consider uh, America to be the barbarians of the West. Meanwhile, so, so where are you on ETs in general, like off space? Uh, you know, real I, I I dealt extensively with these subjects with Preston Nichols in the book Encounter in the Pleiades. Um, he talks about his own stuff with extraterrestrials, but he said that most abductions are done by the government. They're yeah. not by, uh, by ETs. Um, mm -hmm. ETs is a loaded subject because a lot of what people think 
our ETs are not into ETs at all. Mm -hmm. uh, this goes into a, and this is not in this book, it'll be in the subsequent book. Uh, the Chichoa are a tribe in Southeast Asia who are uh, the persona non grata of Southeast Asia. They um, would go to tribes and say, you know, give us money, uh, extort them. And if the, if, they, if the leader wouldn't do it, they'd go into the dream state and kill them. They can kill through the dream state. And a mm -hmm. lot of what, what people have experienced with alien abductions is dream manipulation. Not part, not done sometimes by the government in concert with the Chichoa. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that goes on that would be more in the realm of occult or magic than it would be genuine ETs per se. Um, so the ET issue is very complicated. So it's, but it's not, you know, a huge percentage of these can be isolated as not ET. Um, it could be the, you know, the, like the Wizard of Oz's evil brother um, who's, you know, uh, identified with evil. Right. Um, having an affair with the Wicked Witch of the West and, you know, we don't learn about him. Um, he remains hidden while the other wizard goes back home. So this is an overview of the latest book, The Roswell Deception. There's still a... Uh, uh, pre-publication price offer at skybooksusa.com if anybody's interested. It's also available on Kindle, skybooksusa.com and or Kindle. Um, so and I'm going to post all of these links so everyone can have quick clickable access to purchase and order and get all this amazing information so everyone will be able to to get it. But, but you have so you have tons of books. I mean, you brought up synchronization. You have a whole book on that. I mean, there's. I wrote a book, Synchronicity and the Seventh Seal, which is, you know, 450 pages or so, um, which is about, it's a lot about synchronicity. And um, it's it's got tremendous information, which goes into the etymology of the name uh, Jesus or Yeshua and delivers a... Um, an etymology uh, lesson that every minister would do well to know. And of course, it's actually a, an ancient formula for exercise, exorcism. Um, so that was a part of my journey too. Um, you just realize that the, the real religious people of the world don't know anything. And even the more occult or magic people who know this stuff don't actually get it. Most of them don't get it because they, well, they're they involved. They can't d divorce themselves. Uh, people who study the occult often become possessed. Sad. Yes. And, and you know, it, it goes back to me being a scientist. And my background is ministry. But I kind of like, I'm not saying I don't have any beliefs or need to change my beliefs. But I'm just saying I started looking at everything from a science level and I was actually super surprised at the evidence that supports all these other different ways that are outside of anything that I had heard about and or been programmed to. And then just awakening to the DNA that we have within us that's already there. It's just a matter of surrendering to it and knowing that we can hear and do these amazing things um, pretty regular. And just like synchronicities, you were talking about, you know, getting into someone's field and then having those same synchronicities it, you know when the when the biofield connects with other people who work in other ways you know it's an automatic because the code changes and the frequency changes and there's upgrades and then there's low lo, uh, low vibrations that can bring you down and and it's everything is energy and so um of course when you were talking about you know you started you know, working with these guys and then these things started happening that were sort of supernatural or these synchronicities where people will just show up or this thing just shows up. It's not just showing up. This is all about code. <laughs> no, you're, you're quite correct. And uh, to help people understand is, is um, science has been too dedicated to uh, strictly logic or linear um, there is another side of the brain which is nonlinear, which is creative, intuitive. And 
in, in the ancient schools of Egypt, they recognized this, the left eye of Horus and the right eye of Horus. And you integrate the two sides of the brain. The living is not just linear. Yes. If it was all linear, uh, there would be no need for life. It would just go compute. Uh, computation is done to corroborate and feed the intuitive. And the intuitive, in fact, in computing, they have the word heuristic. Heuristic means guiding principle or guidance. So you're, you're trying, you're, a computer is designed to intuit what you want. This is why, you know, you see it today in the form of advertising. You know, yeah. if you order uh, a yellow um, lollipop, they'll start bombarding you. lollipop, you yes, know. It's like, oh, you like lollipops. And maybe you ordered the yellow lollipop for some reason that has nothing to do with liking lollipops. But it's like, this is what they do. So you, you put something out and, they, and, and it tries to intuitively anticipate what you would want. Um, you know, you start watching occult movies, they'll start feeding you occult movies, anything like that. So, um, and you and you open yourself up to entities and lower vibration occult type situations and or spirits whatever you want to call them like it's whatever we're only where we're at is what we get and so which i'm not <laughs> telling you you know this but um for this is kind of my whole purpose teaching is you know living in truth and remembering truth and staying in um the powerful places of truth and love and the highest frequency things whether it's diet you know who you're hanging out with what kind of job you choose you know where you live what kind of house are you spending out you know time in nature you know but yes definitely who you hang out with is big and what you're putting your eye gates and your ear gates on and you know what you're connecting to what activities and what you participate in because that can change everything here which changes the cells which changes the field which changes what you get exactly so yeah so when, when you look at science you can't just look at it um with complete uh one dimension of logic it has to be um mixed with and and, and people should study complexity studies uh which is a discipline of science which embraces uh the nonlinear and other functions. I mean, you can look at videos on, and this is of course a, a scientific discipline, which too, too few people and too few scientists actually understand and appreciate it. I learned about it in Romania, but it originated in Austria and it's, uh, they have a, I think a complexity studies institute in New Mexico. So it's not unknown, it's just not known well enough by your rank and file uh, person or, and or scientist. Well, and I use tech, I mean, there's technology out there for dis-ease, um, you know, we have like zappers and biofeedback and rife and, you know, everything, again, everything's energy. So even anything, whether it's emotional, mental, what have you, we, we can use some of this equipment and or frequency for the good, um, not just through actual uh, technology and equipment, but just your voice or your thought process, because everything, even that you think or you say, has a frequency. So um, be paying attention to what you're thinking about. You know, sometimes we don't even realize what we're thinking about. We're thinking about whatever, or we're talking about whatever, and we can get, I guess, sucked in to some of these topics of, you know, that aren't necessarily our highest that would, you know, create, but they're using these things against our creative nature and our, you know, our hearts, our minds and whatever by entertainment and sports and all these minions that they get to, you know, put out wherever. And the next thing you know, you're buying that thing or you're listening to that song or you're participating in this behavior or, you know, whatever. So I know, you know, but um, it's just cool to talk to somebody who gets, gets what I'm talking about <laughs> anyway. So well, any, go ahead. No, thank you. It was very nice to be with you. Yes. Any final words? And uh, again, any coming up, you know, 
your books or products or anything, you know, uh, and like I said, any final words to people who are on that path of actually looking for truth and, and, you know, disclosing truth. If anybody's interested, as you say, they can go to the websites, which you'll put up skybooksusa.com is where you can get the books. All of my books are available on Kindle and or Amazon. Uh, the last book I just did is the Roswell deception, which you can get discounted at skybooksusa.com. And thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, I, from my whole heart, I just bless you for your time and just thank you for your um, participation and truth and love and your mission here. And I look forward to having you back maybe sometime. That would be really great to, to have you back sometime. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Bless you.